the Billy Graham Classics. Now tonight, I want you to turn with me to the 11th verse of Jude. Jude is a little book tucked away in the back of the Bible. And there are just a few verses, and this is just a phrase from one verse. And here's what it says. Woe unto them, for they have gone the way of Cain. Woe unto them, for they have gone the way of Cain. Now, that's a strange expression, the way of Cain. And yet, when I pick up the Bible, I find an interesting thing, that there are only two ways of life in the whole Bible. One is the way of Cain, and the other is the way of his brother Abel. Abel was accepted by God, and Cain was rejected by God. So there's the way of Abel, and there's the way of Cain. And tonight I want to talk about these two brothers because they were the first children in the history of the human race. God had created Adam and Eve. And they had two children, their first two children, Cain and Abel. And we find brothers all the way through the Bible like Jacob and Esau and Moses and Aaron and Absalom and Amnon, James and John, Peter and Andrew, Joseph and his brethren. And in the first or the fourth chapter of Genesis, you'll find the story, the fascinating, challenging, thrilling, tragic story of Cain and Abel. You see, they were the first children born. They were the first farmers. They performed the first religious ceremony. And they had the first quarrel and the first act of violence that was ever done on this planet was done by Cain against his brother when he killed his brother in a fit of anger because of jealousy and envy. But Adam and Eve must have been excited when these boys came along because Eve said, I've gotten a man from the Lord. You see, Adam and Eve had just come through a terrible experience. They had rebelled against God in the Garden of Eden. Now, in the Garden of Eden, where they lived, there had never been a war. There were no armies. There were no police. They didn't need them. There were no jails. There was no poverty. There was no suffering. It was a marvelous world to live in. And they rebelled against God. And God drove them out of paradise, drove them out of the Garden of Eden. And it says a very interesting thing at the end of the third chapter of Genesis, so they wouldn't touch the tree of life. Why? If man had eaten of the tree of life, he would have lived forever in his sins. In that sense, death is a blessing to the human race. Suppose Hitler lived forever. Suppose people like Stalin and Eichmann lived forever and plagued the human race. But one generation passes and another comes. It's constantly changing and shifting. God drove them out so they wouldn't eat of that tree of life and live forever in their sins. But God also promised, before he drove them out, God promised that someday he would send a redeemer. And he illustrated it by going out and slaying some animals and shedding blood and clothing Adam and Eve in skins. And God was teaching that the only way ever to approach him in the future, forever, forever, was by the way of blood. And that is why you pick up the Bible and you'll find so much blood. Someone has said that Christianity is a bloody religion, and it is. The blood of Jesus Christ. The Bible says without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. And every time you go and take communion in your church, and you pick up the cup of the juice or the wine, it's symbolic of the blood that was shed on that cross 
for you. And without the shedding of that blood, there is no forgiveness of sin. Now, Cain was born with sinful instincts because, you see, we inherit the instinct to sin from our parents. David said, in sin did my mother conceive me. Isaiah said, all we like sheep have gone astray. We read in our paper last week how they are now painting garbage cans and garbage sacks with psychedelic colors. And they do look pretty. I saw some of them. But inside, it's still garbage. Now, you're all dressed up tonight. Most people, when they come to a religious meeting, a church put on their best. You may come from a poverty-stricken area. You may not get but about $10,000 a year. You may be in dire poverty. <laughs> and you may be suffering in this beautiful bluegrass part of Kentucky. But on the inside, jealousy, pride, lust, idolatry, all the sins that mankind is guilty of is lurking inside of your own heart. You know, Jesus said to the Pharisees of his day that they were whited sepulchers, but inside they were rotting bones of death. No wonder the Pharisees didn't like him. He called them all kinds of names. You read the 23rd chapter of Matthew. He said on the outside, you look beautiful, you look fine, you're religious. You look like you're going to heaven. But I can see inside your heart, I see your pride, I see your lust, I see your hypocrisy. And God knows all the secret things and God looks down inside of you and he says to you, Mr. Baptist and Mr. Methodist and Mr. Assembly of God or whoever you may be, I see you and what I see indicates that your heart is full of rebellion. You need forgiveness. You need to be cleansed by the blood of Jesus. Now, when Cain was born, Eve, I think, thought that the birth of Cain was somehow a gift from God that would cancel out her sins. She thought that maybe Cain was going to be the Messiah that had already been promised. She said, my child is from God. You know, there's evidence everywhere that all of us would like to cancel out our past and our sins. We would like to get in touch somehow with God. But if we reject God's way and go the way of Cain as Cain rejected God, what do we turn to? We turn to the stars. We turn to anything that will get rid of this guilt and give us some purpose and meaning in our lives as to why we exist. And Cain thought, or Eve thought, that maybe Cain was going to help her, her young son. But Cain, you know, was born into a world with tremendous advantages. There'd never been a war. There was no hate and no jealousy, no poverty. He had everything that a person could want. No one was ever killed. Nobody was ever murdered. Nobody ever stole anything. It was a marvelous world. And Cain also was religious. He and his brother both were religious. But that didn't satisfy them somehow. Cain decided to reject God's way. Cain decided to go his own way. And there are only two ways of life, the way of Cain and the way of Abel. They were both religious, and they came to worship God. But they came differently. God said, without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness. So Abel brought a sacrifice of blood. It was ugly, it was dirty. Why did God choose blood? Have you ever thought about that? Many of us are repulsed at the sight of blood. We hate to see it. Our sins are ugly. Our sins are dirty. And every time we see blood, it reminds us of our sins, which are ugly before God and will cause judgment. But Cain 
did not bring blood. He said, it's too dirty, it's too ugly. I'm going to bring the best fruits that I have. I'm going to bring the finest vegetables I have as an offering to God. But the Bible says it's better to obey than to sacrifice. The Bible says only by blood. We say we can get there some other way. We've got our own way figured out. And you know, a lot of people believe in Jesus today. They're accepting Jesus as a revolutionary hero. A lot of people are singing about Jesus, writing about Jesus. All that's fine. I hope it keeps up. But you be sure who Jesus is. He's more than just the superstar. Jesus is the son of the living God. And when he died on the cross, he didn't stay there. He rose from the dead. He's alive. And when he shed his blood, that blood meant something. It meant that God was now able to forgive all your sins. It meant that God was now able to transform you and write your name in the book of heaven because Jesus Christ died on that cross. God can now remain just and be the justifier of the sinner. You see, if I may say so reverently, God faced a dilemma. God said, the wages of sin is death. You have to die. You're under the sentence of death. How can God come along and just forgive it and wipe it out? The jury says that a man like Charles Manson is guilty. But suppose the judge would say, oh, we'll let Charlie go on back. He's got all those girlfriends and all those responsibilities and things. We'll just forget all that. That wouldn't be justice. Suppose God would say that to you. You're guilty. I'm guilty. We've broken God's laws, all of us. God cannot come along and say, let's forget it. Unless somebody pays the death penalty. We're under the sentence of death. Well, somebody did pay the death penalty for me and for you. Jesus Christ on the cross paid the death penalty, shed his blood, and now God can say, I forgive you, the debt is paid. That's how much God loves us. That's what the gospel is. The word gospel means good news. And the good news to the whole human race, black, white, yellow, red, whoever you are, whatever your social standing or your educational status, God is saying, I love you, I forgive you. That's the gospel. And I don't care what your sins are. I don't care how bad they are, how black they are, how dirty they are. God says, I forgive you. I love you. And I proved it by giving my son on the cross. That's the way of Abel. Now, the way of Cain is to say to God, no, I want to go to heaven. I want to be saved, but I'm going to go my own way. I'm not going to come your way, God. I don't like the way of blood. I don't like to go by the way of the cross. I don't want to die to self. I don't want to give everything up that I love, all these desires and passions of mine. They may be wrong, but Lord, I want to hold on to them. I'm going to go my own way, and somehow I'll get that. No, you won't. There's only one way to heaven, one door. It's the way of the cross. And without the cross, there is no salvation according to the Bible. So they brought their sacrifices to God. And you know, we're doing the same thing. We go to church. We try to live a good moral life. We pay our bills. We do the best we can. And we think that's going to be good enough. No, there has to come a time when you must be born again. There has to come a time when you are converted. And notice the scripture says in Hebrews 11:4 that Abel made his decision for God by faith. 
Abel didn't understand it. You don't have to be a theologian to come to Jesus Christ. You don't have to understand much about the gospel or the Bible when you come to Christ. Come with what little knowledge you have. You know you're a sinner. Your conscience tells you that. You know Christ is the Savior. That's all you have to know. Just come and receive it by faith. It says by faith, Abel made his sacrifice unto God. You see, Cain didn't come by faith. He came by his own works and his own goodness and his own ideas, chose his own path, and God said, no, Cain, you're rejected. But he accepted Abel, and Abel, for certainty, is in heaven, and we'll see him someday. Now, what happened? Cain became jealous. He became angry. And one day when they were out in the field, he picked up a rock and hit his brother over the head and killed him. Murder. The first violence. The first murder. The first war in the history of the human race. And it's been going on ever since. And it'll always go on till Jesus comes back and sets up his kingdom. Because you see, war comes from the human heart. The Bible says, from whence come wars among you? Don't they come from your own lust that war in your own beings? The world wars that we fought in this century are only extensions of the wars in our own hearts. There are many wars going on around the world right now, in addition to Vietnam. Man is a warring animal. He'll continue to fight and kill. There are wars going on in the cities of this country right now and in the rural areas. People being murdered by the hundreds every month. People being killed on the highways by drunken drivers and drivers under the influence of drugs. Fights and quarrels in homes between husbands and wives and children and parents. War, war, war. We're a warring people. And the first act of violence was committed by Cain because of jealousy. You see, it started in his heart. He probably thought about it a long time. He was jealous of his brother. And this jealousy gave vent until finally it ended in murder. And God came along one day and warned Cain, said, Cain, you know, sin crouches at the door. Even before he had ever committed that murder, God saw his heart and God saw what he was thinking and God said, Cain, watch out. Sin is in your heart. It crouches like a tiger. It crouches like a lion, ready to spring. I've heard people stand up and say, well, if I were in a certain place, I wouldn't do a thing like that. You don't know what you would do. You give all the circumstances surrounding that certain event, you might do it. We all have the tendency to lust and to hate and to have jealousy and pride in our hearts. We don't know what we would do. We're all rebellious against God. And under given circumstances with the right type of temptation, we might do anything. Or the right type of pressure, we might do anything. And Cain was warned by God, and God warned you in the Bible that you're capable of any sin. And every person in this audience tonight has broken the Ten Commandments, and the Bible says, if you've broken one, you're guilty of all. And after the death of Abel and after the murder had taken place and Cain had probably buried him to try to hide the evidence, God said, Cain, where's your brother Abel? And Cain said, I don't know. Am I my brother's keeper? And then God said this interesting thing. He said, the voice of thy brother's blood cries up from the earth. The Bible says your sins are written down. God said, Cain, you've sinned. I have to judge you. And God did judge him. God said, a fugitive and a vagabond shalt thou be in the earth. And Cain said, my punishment is greater than I can bear. And for the rest of his days, Cain bore that punishment for that one violent act in which he killed his brother. Jealous of him, hated him, then killed him. 
Give your life to Christ and you can face reality. You don't have to have a drug or a pill or a glass to face the reality of life or the circumstances or the troubles or the trials you're going through. Let Christ come in and take over your life and cast all your burdens on him for he careth for you. The Bible says that the Lord set a mark on Cain and Cain went out from the presence of the Lord and dwelt in the land of Nod on the east of Eden. Notice, he was close to paradise yet a million miles from it. Billy Sunday once said, I'd sooner be a foot out of hell and headed away than to be a million miles out of hell and headed toward it. Some of you are close to the kingdom of God, but you might as well be a million miles away because you're headed in the wrong direction. You're headed in the direction of Cain. Religious? but you haven't yet experienced Christ for yourself. Others of you are headed toward heaven and the kingdom of God, stumbling, faltering, failing maybe, but yours is the way of Abel. You come by the way of the cross, and you're saying, Lord Jesus, be my Lord and be my Savior and be my Christ. These two young men, Cain and Abel, typify all the young people that are in the world today. What about you? Have you made your commitment and your decision to Jesus Christ? Have you trusted him? You say, well, Billy, what do I have to do? You have to repent of your sins, and that means you have to be willing to give up your sins and change your way of living. Secondly, you have to come by simple childlike faith. Notice I said childlike. Jesus said you have to become as a little child. Now, there are many professors here tonight. You might be a Ph.D. in science or philosophy or psychology or some other discipline, but you have to become as a little child intellectually and spiritually, and you have to say, Lord, I don't understand this. This is a realm that I don't understand, but I come by faith. It has to be a child's faith, like the faith of a child in its father or mother. And then you have to say, I'm willing to follow you and serve you no matter what the cost. Young man, Young woman, father, mother, whoever you are here tonight, I'm going to ask you to get up out of your seat, hundreds of you, as hundreds have come at every service, and come and stand in front of this platform and say by coming, I do receive Christ. I want to go the way of Abel. I want my past forgiven. I want to know I'm going to heaven. I'm going to ask you to get up and come right now. And after you've come, I'm going to say a word to you, have a word of prayer, give you some literature, and you can go back and join your friends. If you're with friends or relatives, they'll wait. If you've come in a bus, they'll wait. Those of you up in the gallery, it'll take a minute or two for you to come, but you get up and come right now, quickly, hundreds of you. Just get up from everywhere and come and stand here quietly.